Hi, I'm Charlie, and this is Cooking with Community Leaders, on location in Leland, Michigan. Actually, we're in Maple City, Michigan. Technically. Yes. Technically. 11 miles from Leland. Leland All County. Um, and my guest today is Brian Price. Brian, good to see you. Good this see is you, Brian's Charlie. abode here in Maple City. And uh, Brian is the former executive director of the Leland All Conservancy. We'll talk about that. Uh, you've done a lot of work with the Lake Leonal Association. We'll talk about that. Um, and we'll, we'll see if you can remember the names of all your grandchildren. So we'll get to that in, in a little bit. The so, quiz part starts later. Right. Okay. But um, so we, what we like to do is talk about your background and how we got to where we are today. Um, so I know you were born in, or you were born and raised in Battle Creek? Born and raised in Battle Creek. Yeah. And you ended up going to Oberlin College. I did. Proud graduate of Oberlin College. Oh, right. very proud. Okay. We all are. Absolutely. All right. So um, after graduating from college, um, you ended up, is that when you started doing uh, the fisherman? Graduated from college, and the only thing that I knew was I didn't want to go on to grad school. All right. I had with, a degree in geology. <laughs> yeah. Geology. Okay. And I just couldn't quite face up to the idea of going out. But with a degree in geology in 1972, you could either go to work for an oil company doing like grunt work, right? Or, or go on to school, I mean go on to grad school, or find something else to do. So you're you're in Leland, you've moved here after college, and then you find yourself I not worked, wanting to be a geologist. Right. I worked on farms. Uh, there was no construction work, nothing, you know, no grunt work right. that uh, somebody like me could do. One of the things that's always been fascinating to me and keeps recurring in the things that I've done is I love lakes, boats, water, all sorts, right. the Great Lakes. Um, part of the reason I was studying geology is they didn't have a limnology program at Overland College, you know, but you could study geomorphology and how lakes are formed and that kind of thing. And I thought, well, I would love to work on the lake and see what that's like. So I went down to the docks in Fishtown, asked around, is anybody hiring? And Fred Lang and Ross Lang, his son, hired me to be the third guy on the boat. There were just, those were three-handed boats, gillnet tug. And we were fishing chubs. So you you mentioned Fishtown. And Fishtown is a an area in Leland on Lake Michigan mm -hmm. uh, where the fishing boats go out into Lake Michigan. And as a kind of a full circle thing, um, you started working there in Fishtown. And you ended up now, are you still on or, uh, the Fishtown Preservation Board? Yeah. So talk about the Fishtown Preservation Board because now Fishtown has <laughs> kind of like come full circle. Yeah, you know, Fishtown has changed at that point in time, in the early 1970s, there were still three full-time fishing operations in Leland, and there were a few little buildings that had been converted to little retail shops. Right. So, but now Fishtown, 50 years later, yeah. is, a, as if you drive down Main Street in Leland on any nice day as a destination, there's... Six, eight shops down there yep. in the little shanties. I was just there today. I spent two hours down on the dock. Where in the um, process do you end up at the Leland Alpine Conservancy? I thought I would um, become a teacher. Teaching, teaching would allow me to do things that I enjoyed and live here. I was not going anywhere else. Sure. At that point. Just about the same time that I did the additional coursework and was getting certified to teach, and I did get certified to teach secondary science. I heard rumor that the, this organization called Leland Art Conservancy was being founded, and I saw that as an opportunity to go in, and I, I, I understood it to be sort of a local, small-scale version of the Nature Conservancy. And the, the founders were a small board, which is typical, and they had an idea of what they wanted to accomplish, but they hired me to go out and look at areas that had the qualities that really the best and highest purpose 
for that particular piece of land or that area was that it should be preserved. You know, it had great biodiversity, or it had great scenic quality, or it had one thing or another, it, or just even recreational potential, great potential for trails and that kind of thing. And the time was clearly right. Be, this was 1988. Right. We did several projects right out of the gate, but I just I created a file that had about 15 locations around Lillimar County. We reached out to landowners, and sometimes, you know, they didn't have other uses for it and were willing to work with us. Sometimes we bought it. We did receive some donations, or we waited it out. And if it didn't, a few of those places got developed. But the majority, like 10 out of the 15, are now owned by the Conservancy. And open to the public. And oh, I was going to say, land. for those of you who don't know, Leelanau County, um, and you can, by any measure, is one of the richest counties in Michigan. Some say it's the richest, you know, top five, whatever. But the offshoot of that is that people build all over. So the conservancy serves a purpose and only, not only stops the expansion of these of all these things are going on, but it re maintains the beauty and it maintains the nature. And it, it, there's a there's a whole lot that goes with it, other than just you know stopping explosion of uh, of subdivisions throughout sure. the Upper Michigan. There's all trade offs. There's there's trade offs in everything, but if you have that wealthy community and they have an interest in making sure that their presence <laughs> and the presence of that development pressure doesn't destroy the character of the area um, and that that was that was a saleable pitch right there's a lot of really good land conservancies in Michigan and Wisconsin and in the Midwest every state is a little different but uh, we want to by any measure is one of the real successful ones so that's what I wanted to ask you. So you started in 88, and you were the executive director for 30-some, how many years? 27 years. So that's it? Yeah. I thought you got up to 30. Okay, so 27 years. Yeah, nobody kicked me out, though. I stopped when I just couldn't stand any more meetings. <laughs> Nonprofit it, it world. It took you 27 is... years to not stand. To... <laughs> well, what I wanted to ask you is that you started in 88 with an idea and a small group of people that had well, this is what we should do. So when you left, and you could even continue on to where we are today, um, how how would you um, characterize the growth in any quantifiable terms from here when you started to where we are today? Like how many acres of land or how many? I would say that the growth was exponential, but it, in a way it wasn't because it was successful right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. It seemed like people were waiting for somebody to get organized and say, this is our purpose. And we um, had, we decided we wanted to have a large membership. We wanted the buy-in from people all across the county. A member. Yeah. Uh, if, it, if we would have you as a member, obviously, we were going for a very large uh, anybody can allow, They'll allow anybody to be a member if I'm a member. <laughs> so we got, within a couple of years, we had 800 members. Mm -hmm. But we were sending a message, you know, if it's the highest quality natural habitat remaining in this part of the state, we want it. We want to be the owners of it. We don't want somebody else to be owner, owners of it. So that we, by the time I retired from the Conservancy after 27 years, I'm, we were over 10,000 acres protected. Well, I mean, you, the work that you did in the Conservancy is is well documented and, and people really um, appreciate the growth and then it's just a fixture in the community they don't it, it just is part of Leland and Leland County right um, so the the other thing I wanted to talk about was your work with the Lake Association and that's where you've um, <laughs> I've seen interviews and articles I've said you're you're not a biologist but you certainly have a great knowledge of the lake and what's being and so why don't you talk a little bit about what's being done to try to 
um, save some of the, the things that are going on in the lake. Yeah, so I I had been retired for about two years and caught up with projects that I'd been putting off. For, like this house? Like this house, yeah, or <clears throat> I had work to do on this house. Then the Lake Association at the time had one part-time employee and it was called the lake biologist, which I think is actually a really good idea. You want to be science-based and not start out with, in my view, like a communications person or right. a, you ideally want somebody who loves to be out on the water. It, what we discovered early on, I took, the, the, the lake biologist had been in place for about four or five years. And I said, well, I'd like to do that. That's an excuse for me to do something I love, which is to put my boat in the water. It's an excuse for me to actually fix my boat up and invest, put a good engine on it that was reliable mm -hmm. so I could make it run. And I, I, I thought, this is great. I'll go out and do water sampling and I will you know, do some little research projects. And then what happened was before I even started the job, there were reports of this new invasive plant in the lake called Eurasian water milfoil. Nobody knew, is it really in the lake or is it coming off of boats because nobody could find where it was or had found where it was. Where was it growing? But there was enough of it that it was growing somewhere. Right. So that became the, before I even started, that was the like first major job was figure out where this stuff is. But this is the most invasive, troublesome aquatic plant in North America. It is in every state, I think. It is choking waterways all over the place. And it's a big problem for recreational lakes. Right. Do not swim through this stuff. You don't water ski through this stuff. Uh, but it was new to our lake, or relatively new. The problem was, we thought it was new, but it had been there for probably three or so years, because there was already, by the time I documented, found it, and started finding it all over the place, it was five to seven acres, which may or may not sound like a lot, but it is a lot of something when you're trying to kill it in the water. All right. And the normal way that people go about dealing with it when it's at that stage is they, they get a pesticide a contractor, an applicator, and it's easy to get permits in the state of Michigan, and probably is in most states, to take chemicals. But a problem that I, when we started looking into it, and I did some research, nobody's ever eradicated it with chemicals. It comes back. I felt like we should try other things before we go straight to <laughs> the nuclear option. Right. Right? <laughs> and uh, I, I had worked with Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, had a lot of friends over there. They employ real biologists and real field workers, and they, you know, this is part of their original treaty waters, so they, their original treaty reservation, and this water, this body of water. And they were receptive. Which was into Lake Michigan. I worked with a young biologist over there named Dan Mays, and uh, talked to people at the Nature Conservancy and other places, there are a number of options that you have. And the only one that looked really good to us, which definitely kills these plants, is what's called benthic barriers. Benthos, benthos is what's on the bottom of the lake. So the barrier is just a big blanket. And what it does is it prevents the exchange, the sunlight getting down to the plants, and also the flow of gases and nutrients. It cuts it off and kills the plant. Kills whatever's down there. The, the knock on benthic barriers is that they're, it's a goat rodeo. You're wrestling these great big tarps into position in water that is eight or 10 feet down 
And just imagine, like, if you hired the local yacht club guys to try to get these things into the water. But uh -huh. I used to be a commercial fisherman. And I said to I said to the board of directors of the Lake Association, I said to Dan Mays and the tribe, I said, that ain't nothing compared to getting a trap net in the water, which is 1,200 feet long, 150 feet wide, et cetera, et cetera, and has to have the right shape, you know. Right. It, it is different, but we can do this. You know, we just modify the techniques that fishermen use to put trap nets in the, in the water. And it became a kind of a thought experiment then, at that point. I kept telling them, yeah, we can do this. <laughs> sure, we can do it. <laughs> Never <I'm... laughs> And we did. Um, and the first day that we put these big barriers in, we had three barriers, 40 feet wide and 1,000 feet, no. I'm sorry, 400 feet long, 40 feet wide. Okay. And we set them in a modified, and we took a boat, a float, a pontoon boat, rigged it up so you could set these barriers. And it looked like a well, like a haystack going down the lake, you know, once we loaded the boats. and But we were able to set these and set them over the Eurasian water milfoil where we wanted to, and they thankfully behave themselves and soak up water and sit on the bottom. <laughs> Getting it, it turned out that uh, burlap barriers really did work for us. And we're still, <laughs> it's a big project. So right. we're still putting them in four years later. For someone who's retired for however many years now and it's a part-time job, it's, you know, it's kind of a full-time job. So like I said earlier, I like starting things and I like trying to figure out how to attack a problem. And I, I, that's, it's enjoyable to me. It's work, but it's fun. I'm on the water, continue to do it. And I turned it over last summer mm -hmm. to a different guy to be a lake biologist who's far more qualified as a biologist than me. Now I'm just a volunteer. But we are getting down to where we can't find big enough stands of this stuff to set very big barriers. This is good. Yes. Right? We're winning. So your whole career has been both in nature, on the water, um, and then starting specifically with the Conservancy and then the various uh, boards and and local things you've served on, and you've you've been basic trying to serve this community in one form or another for forty fifty years. Yeah, it's you know, it's, and it's to be commended. And you you are someone that is recognized in our community as someone who was a doer who got things done. Mostly, the stuff that I've done is interesting to me and fun. And helpful to the community. And not, and very helpful to the community. Yes. Otherwise, I don't think I'd be interested in doing it. You know? Well, that's, that's kind of why we're here. Well, we're here for a couple of reasons. Um, so I did have <laughs> one of our good, our co a friend who's a, a good friend of ours, Bob Schluter, was on uh, Cooking with Community Leaders Leland Edition last year and asked him to uh, name his grandchildren. And somehow... He missed. How could Schluter mess that up? I don't know. Well, I could mess it up. Probably. But I've you have four kids, and I've been to all, all I've been to four weddings. Yeah, all of them. Right. And but I don't know how many grandchildren you have. So can you, you name all? That, huh? Can you name all your grandchildren? Yeah. Well, our oldest Shannon uh -huh. uh, has two. Okay. Katie just turned thirteen okay. about a month ago, and Andrew is ten. Okay. Two. The next one, Nate, has two. Okay. Maddie is <laughs> putting them on the spot five. here. <laughs> She's going to kindergarten next year. And Emily was just born okay. uh, a year ago. And then Ellen has three. She lives right here in town. You right. see her kids running around. I do. So James will turn 10 this week. And Aiden is eight, and uh, <laughs> Dylan is four. <laughs> this is, is laughing. It's close, it's close. <laughs> She's going to be five. 
Yeah. Okay. September, and she will let you know about it. Okay. And finally, and then finally, uh, Kevin has one, Marion. So I did it. You, know, you can tell Schluter. I, I, <laughs> so and um, they're all going to be here in about three weeks. I was going to say three hours. Um, <laughs> no, three. So uh, back home in Milwaukee, we call this serious people with serious jobs have a little fun. You're retired, and even though you you're uh, doing work, it's work you like to do, and you're volunteering. But we are going to have a little fun. So I wanted to give you one of our aprons to put on, and why don't, you, why don't you tell us what we're preparing today? Oh. Well, we are going to cook ribs on the egg. The egg is right over there. We're going to go over to the egg in a minute. I, I was telling Brian, one of the greatest meals I've ever had in my life, and I've got to go back 30 plus years on this deck was uh, pork chops on that grill, on that egg. You know, I love pork chops. And I I love that. I don't know, why is it, it that the bone or whatever makes the pork chop so much better? I, You know, you can't hardly even find pork chops. The loin's on part of it. But I like, <laughs> you know, our little grocery store has a meat department. Mm -hmm. And if you want an inch and a quarter or an inch and a half pork chop, bone in obviously, you can get that. You know, they will cut it for you. And that's just a wonderful luxury to be able to Well, we're not gonna we're not gonna have pork chops. We're having ribs. <laughs> so uh, give us a couple minutes. We're gonna go get the uh, the green egg organized. Oh well, we and got, then we're gonna we're, we're gonna, gonna start the fire, so and, we don't have to tell them how we're doing it. Oh. So we'll be back in, in just a minute. All right, so Brian's got our ribs. Oh, yeah. And that's, Ooh, look, one for me and one for you. See, my, we have a uh, division of duties, though, uh -huh. where you're going to ask me what that rub is on there, and I'm going to say, I don't know. It's a pork rub. Yeah. So Brian's set up here. He's Some got a kind of rub. This Weber that's an insert here into the um, stoneware. And Brian, why don't you lift the top off of that? And under that is oh, that the chimney it. that we used to fill the egg. Fill the egg. So the egg is ready to go. And anybody that's unfamiliar with an egg, it's a heavy piece of ceramic. It is not a smoker, really. It's, it is a barbecue grill, but it's somewhere in between. And the advantage of an egg, first of all, egg has to have uh, hardwood charcoal. Okay. You do not use briquettes or whatever. And I'm not sure why that is. I think because it poisons the ceramic. You know, everything is absorbed right. or whatever. But it's this massive thing that weighs about 400 pounds. But it because of all that weight and everything, it holds its heat and moderates the heat. Right. The other thing that's different between, uh, the reason you have uh, Weber and you have an egg is that things you want to cook fast, you cook on the Weber. Gotcha. Burgers and steaks and stuff. You want to cook a turkey for Thanksgiving or something, you can get this grill to, you know, you charge it like this. That took 20 minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you can moderate the heat. Right. And it'll go for like six hours, eight hours if you want it to, at right where you want it, like 250 degrees or whatever. Okay. Which is really nice. So I put the ribs on skin side up, skin side down. Uh, skin side. Well, top side. That's about uh, okay. We're gonna gotcha. Put it like that. All right. I can hear a little sizzle. Oh, yeah. All right. And well, how long is it? interesting. I think she forgot to have put the rub on one, yeah. one of them. So, so that's, we'll, that's we'll white get meat. The difference. It's the other white meat, as I used to say. <laughs> <laughs> so how long will these be on? Mm. Well, they're, they're already pre-cooked in right. the oven. So they've There's been in the oven on. for about, what, two or three hours at 200? Yeah. So they're cooked. Okay. And All right. So we're going to finish them. We're going to finish them on the grill and then we're going to eat them. Oh, yeah.
All right. Absolutely. All right. But before we eat them, then yes. we got to cook the vegetables. All right. So we're cooking it's veggies. It's the summertime, today. so we're cooking. We're going to have vegetables cooked on the grill and orzo. Okay. All righty. We'll be back in just a minute. Doom ball. Brian's basting. So we're having a little experiment today. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to... Everything is an experiment. We're going to see what one tastes like with the, the dry rub and <laughs> one didn't quite get the dry rub. So we're... So but it's, it's but still this good. Is, this is the way we do things, though. That's right. You know, like, I have a friend who lives down in Columbus who has got his systems of barbecuing down to, uh -huh. you know, like he's got the grill and he turns it up to, thir you know, he's, he knows exactly what he's doing and he's got his stopwatch. You know, he's going to do a hamburger right. for exactly 30 seconds on this side. And then yeah, whatever. that ain't happening. That's and, not what we're doing he, here. He thinks it's hilarious that the way I do things is, you know, like, okay, well, you know, we're going to... Put that, that, that's a half a beer, right? We're going to do a half a beer on this side. And then we're going to baste it again. And then we'll do it, you know. All right, here's our egg. And, and it, when the burgers are done, when you tonk them with a, you know, with a wrong end of a knife. And they, like, bounce the right way. And All right, so we've got some veggies here. And they're going to go, they're going to... They'll cook pretty fast. Huh? Mm -hmm. we got some... Mushrooms and zucchini and tomatoes and red tomatoes peppers and onions. Mushrooms. Yeah, mushrooms. red onion, yellow peppers, red peppers. And I'd show you the the uh, ribs, but they were right there. <laughs> <laughs> They're not there right now. They've gone inside. So these will be on a plate with our ribs, and we're going to sit down and enjoy them in just a minute. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. All right, here we are. <laughs> so. Brian, tell us what we got here. What we have is ribs cooked on the egg. Uh -huh. There's a special rub on part of it, but not on the <laughs> other part, apparently. <laughs> Looks good to me. And we have a little orzo salad. And there's an orzo salad with uh, red and yellow peppers, zucchini, mushrooms, uh, yellow squash. Of some sort. And a little feta. Feta. Uh, onions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, red onion. All right. And, and the veggies are cooked on the grill. Right. You take the ribs off, you let them rest for a little while. Okay, a little and char on the. And it doesn't take here. long to cook the veggies. So. All right. Let's dig in. I'm going to be a little oh, measured yeah. and have my salad first. Mm. <laughs> Takes a smoke on that veggies. And they're softened, but still, they're cooked. They should be. Like, normally, I'd get a little more char on it, but the fire is, you know, What's pretty it? low by now. It's fine. Like a, they're all cooked. Zucchini, nice little char on this. Zucchini's cooked. Zucchini and squash cook quickly on the grill. Oh, yeah. All the veggies do. That's why you cook the ribs first. Set them aside in five minutes, maybe ten at most, to cook the veggies on the grill. All right, I'm gonna Go try our ribs. Right. Delicious. Sweet baby rays on the, uh, <laughs> the mare. <laughs> Sweet the baby sauce. rays. Yeah. Well, we haven't figured out anything better. We're not looking, really. I'm going to take one more bite. It tastes like barbecue sauce does. Well, I'm, I'm going to eat all this, but I'd take one more bite <laughs> first. There's a whole other rack in there. Well, Brian, excuse me. Here, I'll give you this, too. <laughs> I have one. I'm going to shake your hand. Thank you <laughs> for taking the time, inviting me out here. Talking about the work you've done over the last 30, 40 plus years, everything that's gone on in the community, and you named all your grandchildren. <laughs> and at, at bonus points for their ages. Uh, close. Close enough. That's yeah. the, the, the thing that I will never remember. 
And Susan remembers the birthdays. No. <laughs> she knows most of their birthdays. And I just know, eh, it was fall, it was spring, I, or, you know. I got you. Yeah, I'm, I I'm, couldn't tell you. I actually know the birthdays of my kids, but not my grandkids. I know my kids' birthdays, and that's how I figure out how... I know what year they were born, so I have to work backwards and figure out how old they are. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. thanks for watching. Appreciate the way everyone's that support. Brian. Yeah, Brian's fine. <laughs> I'm the Brian's. Brian's busy eating. It's really good. I don't want to <laughs> eat while it's while it's warm, Brian. So, really, thanks everyone for your support. Please like and subscribe. Appreciate uh, your support for cooking with community leaders. Leland edition. All right. <laughs> and we're out. Leland. Thanks for listening to another episode of Cooking with Milwaukee Community Leaders. Cooking with Milwaukee Community Leaders is brought to you by Cooking Secrets for Men, LLC, and was recorded in the Third Ward in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We feature and profile community leaders who are trying to make Milwaukee a better place. The tagline is, serious people with serious jobs having a little fun. Our guests choose the recipes that we use on the show. All of our podcasts are available on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever you get great podcasts. The original YouTube video for this episode is available on our YouTube channel, Cooking Secret for Men, all rights reserved. Thanks, and see you next time on Cooking with Milwaukee Community Leaders. <laughs>